One of my jobs, among many, is to w make sure that the content that we send out into the world through tours, through programs, through exhibits, is not only interesting and engaging and fun, but historically accurate and supported by good, solid research methodologies. Um, and so part of what I've been experimenting with this fall is, is words. It, what do words actually mean? And one of the words we use a lot here at Historic Aids Mill County Park, I'm sure a lot of you say it thousands and thousands of times a year, is yeoman farmer. And one day I had the crazy idea to look it up and figure out what exactly a yeoman farmer was. And um, that is a rabbit hole that I will leave to nimbler minds. Um, but it is definitely, it got me thinking about the way we use words like yeoman farmer. Do these words change over time? How were they originally conceptualized and what do they mean to us now? And as part of that, we started looking at tour content and, and where can we bring all this wonderful new information. And Rebecca and Jen and I have been working on that. Um, and then we got the idea that once we got an understanding of what was going on, we thought, well, we really need to share this with the volunteers, our frontline interpreters, folks who talk to our visitors every day about this. We can't be greedy and keep it all to ourselves, so we wanted to bring it to you. Um, but again, we wanted to bring it through much nimbler minds, so we're very lucky uh, that Dr. David Zonderman is here um, to talk to you guys about who are yeoman farmers? Who were these people? Uh, what kind of labor did they do? Um, he is a, pro a professor at NC State. He's also my professor, so please be nice to him. <laughs> um, he got his, let me see if I can get his creds right. Uh, he got his bachelor's from Amherst College and his master's and PhD from Yale. Um, he's an American labor historian, author of two books, Aspirations and Anxieties, New England Workers and the Mechanized Factory System and Uneasy Allies, working for labor reform in 19th century Boston. He's a fellow Yankee, so I appreciate that. Um, he's also uh, very well published in the world of American history journals um, and is also a museum exhibit consultant. He's one of the many uh, folks who were involved in the conceptualization of our exhibit here. So he's very familiar with historic Gates Mill, with its history and the formation of the park. Um, and he's also had extensive experience teaching, not only at the college and master's degree level, but with high school and other adult audiences. Um, he offered numerous lectures and courses through the Humanities Extension Program, the High School Outreach Program, and the Encore Center for Learning Enrichment at NC State. And in 2001, he, was, he received the Outstanding Extension Service Award from uh, CHAS, which is the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, um, and he is also, I believe, the faculty member liaison to the chancellor's department now. Is that correct? So he is, and he's also our associate department head um, for the history department. So he is well loved and well traveled, and we're so grateful to have him here today. Well, hopefully I can begin to live up to that introduction. Um, let me begin by saying, honestly, it's always a pleasure to be here. As, as Hillary said, I, I very quickly, I have a number of different connections with this park. I actually, I think I first saw this mill on my first visit to Raleigh where, before I really knew anything about the city and was just beginning to get lost going everywhere and thought it was a remarkable place. Um, and shortly after I began teaching here 20 years ago, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Vandenberg from the zoology department, who first was sort of um, uh, raising the banner of what to do here and to really restore the mill. Um, and now, of course, uh, Rebecca's actually had a class with me. Jennifer is a graduate of our public history program. Hillary soon will be a graduate of our public history program. So we have our, our whole NC State public history mafia working here. <laughs> so it's really a pleasure um, to be here. Um, what I'm going to do today is really just talk briefly and informally uh, I was asked to talk about this sort of, as Hillary says, the word yeoman farmer sounds simple, but it really is a, uh, actually a quite complex historical little knot. Uh, but I'm going to keep my remarks sort of pretty, pretty focused on just a couple of quick topics. I want to talk a little bit about what the word means and where it originated. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of what most of us today might think the word means, which isn't always, as often happens in history, quite the same thing. We seem to build up lots of layers of kind of belief and mythology that aren't always quite linked to the historical documentation and evidence. 
Um, and then I want to come back to a little more about exactly what was life like for these yeoman farmers, particularly here in the South, and then close very quickly by saying a little bit about their role, especially in the American Civil War, because they, particularly Southern yeomen, had a sort of interesting role in that war. So if we could have the first slide, please. And again, I would just, my philosophy is, I've just made a couple of brief slides. I'm a huge believer that you are all intelligent people. I'm assuming you're literate. I'm not going to read slides to you. I'm going to do, use slides the way I do with my own students. I call them my open notes. So I'm going to kind of riff on whatever is on the screen there. Um, but the words yeoman farmer do come originally from Britain. We're not sure exactly when, but somewhere in the what we would call the early modern period, probably the 16th and 17th centuries, um, is when the concept starts to be talked about more and more in Britain. And of course, the 17th century is when some of those British settlers begin to find their way here to the, the New World, and eventually they'll find their way here into North Carolina right around the late 1600s, early 1700s. And basically, the term in Britain meant two things. One was a farmer who cultivates his own land. You were a landowner. You weren't a tenant, you weren't a cropper, you weren't a cottager, you were on your own land. Um, and over time, and again, when I mean over time, over decades and over centuries, yeomen began to acquire more political rights as well. The idea was if you owned some land, you were independent and therefore could be a, a voter. Um, and so in England, as they begin to develop concepts of voting and what were called freeholding, um, Yeoman farmers, and, and again, I, I, this is where it does get really complex, because it varies over time. It varies by county and borough in the British parliamentary system. Um, I won't bore you with all the details. It's a long process, but eventually this is a group. They are below the aristocracy, below the gentry, and yet they are landowners. They're not landless. So eventually they do become another group that will acquire political rights. And of course, in this country, by the late 18th century, um, Thomas Jefferson is one of the people who talks a lot about yeomen. Uh, Jefferson often writes about that he thinks that the, one of the great strengths of the, of the United States is that as it becomes a nation is that we are a nation of yeoman farmers. And again, talking usually about men, he, he says the advantage is these are men that own their own land, they are independent, they cannot be bought, they cannot be bribed, um, and they are, they are self-sufficient and politically have a kind of political integrity. Um, now, I'll just quickly add Jefferson's so in Jefferson's mind, there were probably more yeomen than really existed, and their political sort of purity and independence was probably somewhat more debatable than he wanted to admit, but that's Jefferson's <coughs> sort of ideals as he went on and on. So let me pick up a little more on that idea of the ideal of the yeoman. So if we could have the next slide, please. Um, I think very often today, when people hear the word yeoman farmer, they this is a kind of image that comes to them. Does anybody know this image? Is it familiar to anybody? Yes, sir. Sure. Sir, um, you just want to say what uh, is it? I, I think it's in uh, Concord Dance. You're exactly right. Very good. It's the the statue at, at Concord at the National Park, in the Minutemen National Park. Um, it is done by Daniel Chester French, the same uh, um, artist, same sculptor who did the Lincoln Memorial. This was done when he was a very young man. It was done in 1875 for the centenary of what the folks in Concord still call the Concord fight. Um, and we, of course, think of it as the first battle of the American Revolution. There's also a Minuteman statue on Lexington Common as well that is a bit different than if any of you are all interested in the history of American sculpture. It's kind of fun to compare the two. Um, but again, it is, if you ever go there, it's a beautiful, very stunning statue. Um, and as I say, you can sort of look at that, and if you've been to Lincoln Memorial, you would see sort of French's work as in, in, at his full maturity when he was a man of about 70. That was his sort of last great work. This is the first work that he did some 45 years later that put him on the map as a young sculptor. And on the base is, is, a, um, is, an, is an, a stanza from Ralph Waldo Emerson's famous Concord Ode by the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. There the embattled farmer stood and fired the shot heard around the world. I, I grew up not far away from there, so we all learned that poem as school kids. Um, let me say, let me open, let me step into one other thing a little bit today, because I, as I was working on this, I couldn't help but think about, of course, the debate we're, we're having now, especially this week, but also over the past month and over the past umpteen years about gun control, Second Amendment, etc. Some of you may know this is a very common image, also given in that whole debate, and very often people wrap sort of. 
their ideas of what is the, the yeoman farmer into ideas of independence. And, I mean, obviously this is a man with a gun, with his musket, not an AK-47 or whatever, his musket. Single loading, breech, lo- breech loading, meaning you load it from the front. Excuse me, muzzle loading, pardon me. See, I'm not a gun expert. Muzzle loading, single shot, loaded by hand. Um, and again, let me just quickly, because one of the things, um, my original training is in what's called American Studies, which is both history literature with a little bit of art thrown in, and as they always say, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. But, but it's very interesting how people sort of even today, quote unquote, read the image of this statue. Um, very often people will tell you, this is a farmer standing on his own land with his gun, defending his home, saying basically, my property, my gun, get the heck off if I don't want you here. But that's not entirely accurate. If you notice, his coat is on the plow, and he seems to be moving forward. And if you know what the men at Concord that day did, when the British came to Concord, every farmer wasn't on his own land saying, get the heck off my land. They had all left their land to go to the north bridge of Concord. And it wasn't just men from Concord. It was men from surrounding towns as well. They formed their militia. They formed their, their, their Minutemen companies. So, in effect... The, we read this today often through our own eyes, but in fact the men of the time would have thought a militia and the right to bear arms is not the right to have a gun on your own home to keep anybody else off. It's the right to form that militia unit to defend your community as a whole. It really is a communal right. So, again, I don't want to get too deep in this today because I really don't want to start the fight I'm sure we're all going to have as a nation. But I just have to say as a historian... I do. My big annoyance is not that we have a debate. That's what we're supposed to have if we're a democracy. But it's when people take historical evidence and, and both misread it and sort of twist it like a pretzel. That Then I have to say as a historian, wait a minute, folks. You can have whatever opinion you want. You can believe Martians wrote the Constitution. It's a free country. But please don't speak in the name of history. So I would urge you if some of your friends or whatever start talking Second Amendment, et cetera, and sort of, you know, talking about the Minutemen and the yeoman farmer, please remind them that the first half of the Second Amendment uses words like militia and security of the state. It also talks about the right of the people, not a person. And that's another thing that some of these so-called strict construction constitutionalist folks seem to miss. It's right there in the text. The Fifth Amendment talks about a person's right. This is the people's right. It is a collective right. And the final thing I'll point out, and this is one thing that I see a lot now in op-eds, and I'm just, I am just want to kind of scream when I read them. People have this idea today that the, the yeoman farmers formed militias to protect themselves from the government. No, that's backwards. They formed, militias were designed as, as entities of a government. By the time, remember, by the time we wrote the Second Amendment, we had our own country. We weren't fighting the British anymore. Second Amendment was written while we were the United States. We had our own country, our representative government, same government we have today. Now, we may not like it all the time, but it's not really a tyranny. Some of you like to call it that. So again, this is just an example of how sort of what to me is a very powerful image and a very important one. Again, if you ever go to Concord and see it, I think you'll be impressed. It's a beautiful piece of sculpture. But it's an example of how we take images, we take words like yeoman farmer, we take words like militia, right to bear arms, etc., and we, in effect, read them today, but then claim that's the way people read them 200 or 240 years ago. And as a historian, that's the part I want us to all be careful about. It's not always to say, because we read it this way today, the people 240 years ago read it the same way. No, we've got to keep our terminology straight again. So without going further down that rabbit hole, I just couldn't, because it's so timely today, and so timely this week and this month and all, I just felt I had to throw that in. And it's very much related to yeoman farmers because those, those are the people we think of when we think about the original men with the right to bear arms and form militia. Okay, next slide, please. Well, let's talk a little more about the yeoman farmers in the South because those are the ones you talk about, the people who might have actually gone to this mill and used its, its services. Um, and again, much like in England, we, the term was used fairly similar here, both in colonial and in, the ni- in 19th century North Carolina. Yeomen were considered small landowners, and sort of emphasis on both words. You owned your own land. You were not a renter, you were not a tenant, you were not a sharecropper, but usually your holdings were fairly small. Now, what's fairly small? 
that could kind of vary. I would guess usually anywhere from 10 to 100 acres would be up, considered a small family land holding. The other key here in North Carolina was most of these yeoman farmers uh, owned few, if any, slaves. Now, some of them did own slaves, but it was unlikely they would have owned more than a handful. And for some of them, they didn't own any slaves. If they needed extra help, they would depend on family labor and perhaps occasionally a hired hand. So the connection between yeoman farmers and slavery is a kind of uh, tenuous one at times. The other important thing to know about North Carolina, some of you may already know this, I'm guessing some of you enjoy North Carolina history, we had fewer large plantations than many other southern states, fewer than Georgia, fewer than Virginia, fewer than South Carolina. Um, Why that is, again, is almost a whole separate lecture. I don't want to, the very quick answer is it has something to do with migration patterns, with original land holdings, with the nature of the land itself. Let me quickly add, we did have some large plantations right here in Wake County, the Cameron Benahan plantation. Um, some of you who have been to Stagville know some, of, some about that. was an enormous plantation, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres and hundreds of slaves. Um, the Mordecais had a fairly large plantation. In fact, they, were, they had connections by marriage to the Cameron Benahans. Um, the family that owned Stagville out in the eastern part of the state was a fairly large plantation. So we had some, but not nearly as many as other states. So what that means for our purposes today is if you have fewer big plantations, you have more what we would call yeoman farmers. And again, some historians who have looked at census data from North Carolina before the Civil War have estimated almost as much as two-thirds of the population might have fallen into this category of yeoman farmer. Other historians say that figure may be a bit high. It may be 40, 50 percent. Again, I'm, I'm, I have not studied the census data myself, so I don't know where I would fall in that demographic argument. But for our purposes, it is, I think we can say in general terms, North Carolina had a fairly large population of yeoman farmers and probably as a percentage of the population, a higher percentage than many other southern states. Um, and the other thing to remember is these were farmers who not only had relatively small land holdings, um, but they tended to grow fewer cash crops. They grew less tobacco and cotton, though they might grow some. I'm not saying they didn't grow any, but less than the large plantations. They were more likely to grow subsistence crops, food crops, and raise livestock, especially hogs, chickens, things of that sort. Okay, and if we could just have our final slide. And the final thing I just want to make a few remarks about is the connection between yeoman farmers and the coming of the Civil War. And in fact, one of the questions that to this day historians often ask, we often torment our students with this question, if you don't have any slaves or if you only have a couple, why did so many of these yeoman farmers pick up their guns and go fight for the Confederacy? And again, some of you may know this, North Carolina was one of the most reluctant states to join the Confederacy, and yet once the state joined the Confederacy, it contributed to almost more states than more, more soldiers than any other state and had a higher casualty rate than almost any other state. And that is a very, that is a very interesting sort of, of side of North Carolina's history, this kind of um, reluctance and caution, and yet once committed, sort of committed all out to the cause. Well, why is that particularly for these yeomen? Because many of them either had a a small number of slaves and many of them had none at all. Why fight for the Confederacy? And again, historians offer us kind of four different reasons. And and I'm one of those historians who always kind of picks all of the above. You know, if I'm giving this on a multiple choice test, I'd say E, all of the above. Um, I'm somebody who often believes, not always, but very often I believe major decisions like this have multiple causes. It's very hard to put everyone in one basket. But for some... Some men seem to have responded to the growth of this concept of what we call today Confederate nationalism, this idea that they began to believe that this was a separate nation and therefore you fight for the nation. Um, Many others, I think, really did come to believe that even though they may not have any slaves or very few, that they as white landowners had a certain advantage in a slave system because just by being white they gained certain privileges that Africans and African Americans did not. By being a free person, they gained advantages that a slave did not have. So that's another argument, is that even if you don't, if you'll pardon the expression, even if you don't have a dog directly in the fight, you gain something out of it. Um, Two other reasons would have been more kind of emotional reasons. One was once the war began and it became a war of sort of invasion and conquest, 
many Southerners said, well, you know, maybe I don't really like getting into this war, but now that it's come, I'm defending my home, my hearth, my family, my farm. Um, and obviously that resonated very powerfully. And finally, and I think this is actually true on both sides, there have been some interesting work done on the Union Army as well, Many men who went off to war got caught up in kind of concepts of masculinity and bravery and honor and sort of sticking with your buddy. Um, there's a very, some of you may know the name James McPherson, who recently retired from Princeton, one of the fine, I think one of the finest Civil War historians of the past 50 years, and I'll put in a plug, he's coming here to Raleigh in a month to speak at NC State um, in honor of one of our retired colleagues, Dr. William Harris, who recently won the Lincoln Prize in Civil War history. So we're really thrilled that Jim McPherson is coming. He's a longtime friend of Dr. Harris. Um, and he's actually written a book about sort of getting at that question, why did these men fight, and not only fight, but fight battle after battle in the slaughter around them? Why wasn't there more people just saying, heck no, no more, I'm not doing this? And for McPherson, he, he did, one of the things he did is he read a lot of the letters these men wrote back home. And very often they resonate with this idea of, I have to see this through because I don't want to be thought a coward. Or I have to see this through because the guys around me, we all depend on each other. And I don't want to be the one to, to abandon my, my buddies. And in, any of you that have had any military experience, particularly combat experience, my guess is some of that resonates with you. Or if you've had family that have done that and talked about that, that resonates probably. So many different reasons. But again, it is a, it's a, I think, I, I, you know, again, I'm a relative newcomer to this state, only been here 20 years, but I think it's one of the fascinating things about this, this state's history, is that we were a state, as the war approached, we were very reluctant to join it. And yet once in, North Carolina was a deeply committed state, even though so much of our population wasn't deeply involved in the slave system, per se. But because of the connections to it, because of the connections to the Confederacy, because of these kind of emotional, psychological connections, the connections eventually became quite deep in this state. Okay, well, I've, I know I've, in a relatively short time, I've touched on about 20 different topics, but I'm happy to get you thinking a little bit. Um, and I understand this has been taped, so feel free to use it in any way, shape, or form, if you ever want to use it again, or don't, or hide it, or whatever. Um, but I guess... Do I have a couple minutes for questions? Or I'm looking, okay, so I'm happy to. Yes, please. When the Lord of the Pride was the granted land from the king in England, how did the yeoman farmers obtain their land? It's a very good question. Um, for the most part, they would have acquired it over time by purchase from, from larger landholders. And the larger landholders you know, saw this as a way to make money. Well, you know, kind of like today, you break up a large land holding and subdivide it for a suburban development or something. That's a, some of the best parallel I can offer for back then. Eventually, it became a way to, to make money as you divide up larger estates. Now, not everybody did. It, some were more reluctant to divide them up than others. But particularly here in the Carolinas, as I understand it, and I'm not an expert on, the, on colonial deeds, uh, but as I understand over time, many of them thought this was a way to make, to make money. Um, now, where there were squatters, what they did is the opposite. They would try to, re the, the, the land title owners would try to say to people, you're squatting, either get off or buy the land from me. So you did have some squatting going on, too. And in fact, that happened a lot, particularly kind of on the fringes of settlement. Um, but in the more settled areas, people eventually had to buy the land. Um, Samuel Pearson got his land. Um, we have copies of his land deeds. He purchased it from the Granville Land Office, which is mm -hmm. under the proprietary And I'll, I'll quickly add, it didn't happen in all areas. For example, up in New York, in upstate New York, there were large, what were called patroon ships held by Dutch landlords. And in many of those cases, those remained intact well into the 19th century. I mean, you can read about stories going well into the mid to late 19th century of these enormous... A lot of that eventually became the Adirondack State Park. The state took it. Uh, but we're talking enormous land holdings that were held for a much longer time in, a, in almost a kind of semi-feudal system. But down here, that, that feudal system breaks down by the middle of the 18th century. And then, as I say, sometimes it's willing. Sometimes it's people saying, I can make money. In other cases, it produces a lot of tensions on the frontier. Um, as if I remember, and I may be wrong on this, but if I remember correctly, it's one of the sources of tension that leads to some of the regulator movement in the middle of the 18th century. It's people angry about access to land and who's controlling the land and why can't we get access to land. Any other questions? 
Yes, please. What kind of currency they use? Which period? <laughs> in, the, in the 18th century. Um, well, two answers would be before the revolution, um, there wasn't a lot of currency, and what they used was mainly either British or some Spanish money. Um, usually coinage, because people didn't want paper money. A lot of it, my guess, and some of you may know better than I, but my guess is the miller here would have taken a lot of barter trade and not always taken cash money, because people just wouldn't have had it, and it would have been more of a barter economy. Through the revolution, and at the end of the, by the end of the revolution, all the states are, have been issuing paper money to try to, in quotes, pay their debts. Um, but again, we're living in a world that, that and this is one of the things I, I'm very challenged when I try to teach this to students today, because of course we've all lived in a world of paper money. When I try to explain to a student that paper money can be worthless, they look at me like I'm nuts. I have a $20 bill in my wallet, what do you mean? I can't go get a pizza with it? But I try to put them back 250 years ago where paper money was very suspect. So by the end of the revolution, we actually had a lot of paper money in circulation, but most people, most creditors didn't want it because it was actually losing value compared to gold. So, and compared to products, what would, you know, what a dollar of, a, a dollar's, a gold dollar's worth of flour might be $10 paper money to buy that same sack of flour. And again, trying to explain that to sort of students today is a little bit of a challenge. Um, so, paper, it's really not until paper money sort of remains suspicious in much of this country until well into the 19th century. And of course, here in the South, People are burned once again with Confederate paper money because the Confederacy, of course, collapses and that money is worthless. And one of the things the, the federal government does, uh, in fact, I was just talking with a high school class about this recently. Um, if you look, I don't know how many of you ever looked at the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, but it covers everything but the kitchen sink, including citizenship rights, you know, our rights to due process. There's also a clause of the 14th Amendment that has to do with debts. That's the one that says the debt of the federal government shall not be questioned. Um, but it also, in, in effect, says that the federal government is not going to pay the debt of the Confederacy. It, it has fancier language than that. But that's the part of the Constitution where, where the nation repudiates the Confederate debt. So people that had Confederate paper money or Confederate bonds... Now, of course, if you have them today and they're authentic, they're worth a lot as, as an antique. <laughs> but they're not worth anything... You know, you can't go back and reclaim them. So currency is fascinating because, again, it's fun. I find it fun to teach because it's a great way to show students sort of both the parallels to the past but also in some ways, I don't know if you know the famous phrase, the past is a foreign country. There are ways in which, you know, there are ways in which we could come back to Yates Mill. If we could go back in a time capsule and come back here 250 years ago, it would look a lot alike, obviously, because you've done a fabulous job of restoring it. And there'd be elements of it that would kind of strike us as familiar. But there are other elements that we would think, Oh my goodness! People did that, or acted that way, or you know, didn't use money, or you know, brought a chicken and traded it to grind corn. You know, I don't know about you, but when you go to Walmart and you bring a live chicken, you're probably not going to get very much. <laughs> so you know, so in some ways, it has changed a lot. There was another question. Yes, sir, please. Uh, I grew up in Indiana. My great grandfather fought for the Union. I think it was the 59th Regiment. Mm -hmm. he spent half the Civil War in the hospital with dysentery, but he ended up going with Sherman on Sherman's march to the city. Don't say that too loud down here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I can say this in safety. But anyhow, he was, Maybe. He was mustered out at Wilmington. Okay. He had a lot of history on him during his time in the Civil War, but I just, I've always wondered how he would have returned from Wilmington to Indiana, whether they gave him a horse, was that common? And then number two, would he have been in any danger because most of the territory had to through to get home was you know, the, both great questions um, and I can't obviously I can't give you a specific answer my my best guess is a couple of things he either I'm not sure he would have got a horse unless he was some kind of officer yeah. it, probably he either walked a lot literally I mean lots of walking over weeks or he probably hopped rails various railroads um, there and in fact here in North Carolina the railroads were more intact than they would have been, say, down in Georgia or where, where Sherman was really doing his busy work. Um, so uh, here in North Carolina and further up through Virginia and all the, the road, the road from Wilmington back to Indiana, probably you could have cobbled it together and walking in between, maybe, maybe by river to some extent as well. Um, traveling back, that's a, that's a great question. And I, I, 
I could swear there's a couple of scholars that have recently been working on that. Um, and I read a lot about there were bands of guerrillas after the war. Absolutely. You know, absolutely they true. Kept fighting. Um, and that's especially true in the western part of North Carolina. Okay. That kind of guerrilla warfare also it went on during the war and after the war. And it was a combination of kind of economic banditry and bitter, bitter political rivalry. Because in the western part of the state, there was a good deal of union sentiment. There was a lot of yeoman farmers who had no slaves at all out west. And they really did not want the war at all. So that's, that's probably another thing I should have added was you have to think somewhat regionally in this state as well. But my guess is a lot, my guess is a lot of those guys, if he had friends from the same town, or from nearby, they, they probably buddied up. Yeah. Or even if you had a guy going as far as Ohio, yeah. you figured, well, if we went together to Ohio, I'm safe when I get to Ohio. Safe. Because you're right, you probably didn't want to be wandering alone yeah. in a Union uniform. Because people knew you won the war, but if you were on your own, they didn't care. Yeah. So that's a very, very good, and it's a great story. One way or the other, so if you could ever find you know, more accounts of how people got back home, it would be a great story to tell. It's hard to find, or yeah. it was for us, it's hard to find those stuff. No, you're right. You can sometimes find the muster out records. Yeah, we found them. And then after that, it's sort of, then you just don't, somehow they made it back. So, <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, Again, just give me, you let me know my time, folks. So, <laughs> please, sir. British rule, did the military call anyone if they needed Yes. Um, when the British, when the British, I mean, the best example would be um, North Carolina during the French Indian War, the Seven Years War. Um, and the British basically fought the war in North America with three different kinds of troops. There were British troops that were sent over. There were, there were what were called the Continentals, which were actually American soldiers formed into groups. They were actually paid by the British or by American colonies, a kind of combined full-time local army, you might call it. And then there were local militias that would just be called out for a, a, ba- a nearby battle. For example, George Washington during the French Indian War was a commander in the Continentals, but not in the British Army. He never there's an old joke among historians that if George Washington never got his commission in the British Army, we might never have had the American Revolution, or we might not have won it, because he probably would have become a British general, not an American general. And and Washington was very, very um, indignant about that. He thought they had dissed him by not giving him a, they gave him a command in the Continentals, but not in the British Army. And that's a really both prestige and you also made a heck of a lot more money with that. So, um, but yes, they would call out militia very often. Um, and again, let me quickly, this is again is a story for a whole other lecture, but here, here and immediately west of here during the American Revolution was a deeply divided area. Much of North Carolina was deeply divided between loyalists and patriots. And almost throughout the entire American Revolution, particularly during the beginning and toward the end, there was both military conflict, meaning battles going on, but also a lot of internal um, uh, deep bitterness between families, vendettas, guerrilla warfare. All, I mean, it's one of the reasons why the British, the British kept losing up in the north and then kept coming back to the south, be, thinking that the south was more vulnerable. And it was, partly because, don't forget, a lot of adult men would not be given access to guns because they were adult male slaves. And the other reason was here in the South, it was a very deeply divided population. There was very strong loyalist sentiment and very strong patriot sentiment. And so it was deeply divided. So, in effect, militia were being called out on both sides. In other words, depending on where you lived, and in some cases, militia units split. So you might be together before the war began, but two years later, you and three of your neighbors might actually be on the American side. You're going to join them for a battle, and a, an old friend of yours, a former friend of yours, lives five miles away. You hear Joe, Joe Smith has gone off with other bu- buddies from what was your regiment to join the British. So a lot of that went on here in the South, much less up North. Uh, up North, there was a lot of loyalists, but they tended to be much more elite. It wasn't the sort of yeoman militia guys. They tended to be unified in the Patriot cause. So there was a lot of bitterness, and, and some of it lasted after the revolution, a lot of bad blood. I think we can take one more question. Okay, Dr. sure. Dr. Norman, we've invited him to stay um, with us through the reception, so if you have any more sure. questions. Sure, absolutely. Yes, sir. I was uh, thinking back to the question about arms, and I would presume that most of these yeoman farmers had arms because they used them for hunting. Would that be correct? Yes, 
Yes, um, they would have. And again, that's that's um, certainly there's an and within the history of this country, the the ownership of an individual gun for hunting and sort of for that level of protection would have been considered normal. Um, and in fact, that's another big debate among historians is how widespread gun ownership was. Um, and there have been several studies. One that was quite got a lot of press and then proved to be quite controversial in its methodology. And so to this day, we don't. It, it tends to vary a bit by region and by township. And not surprisingly, in, in ur- more urbanized areas, there'd be less gun ownership. Um, in the rural areas, more. Um, and again, hunting, protecting flocks from wolves or bears. Um, so yes, there absolutely was was an element. But the Constitution recognized it more as being necessary for because the men who wrote the Constitution thought we want people to have guns because we don't want the government or we don't want to, we don't want the British trying to do what they did, which is to take away our guns so they can colonize or keep colonizing us. But now that we have our own country, we want men to have guns because we want the militia to be the unit that defends the nation. Remember, the Constitution also talks about treason. If you take up guns to fight a duly elected government, you're not fighting tyranny. In the eyes of the Constitution, you're committing treason, and that's a capital crime. So, again, today we seem to get our terminology backwards sometimes. Um, Again, if if you know anything about why we wrote the Constitution when we did, 1787... The year before, there was a giant revolt in Massachusetts called Shays' Rebellion. A guy named Daniel Shays got a bunch of angry farmers together and closed down courthouses all over western Massachusetts, not far from where I went to college. There's people talk about Shays. And in some cases, he's seen as a kind of quasi-Robin Hood. But in the eyes of the judges, he was an outlaw. He 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 was committing treason, mutiny against the government. So by the time we're writing the Constitution, remember the revolution is over. We have our own government. So now we see the militia as not a body that rises up and fights the government. It's a body that protects the government. So again, we need, it's all about, you know, as I'm always saying to my students, Hillary can tell you this, it's all about context. It's all about timing. I'm always saying, what time period are you talking about? Are you talking about, you know, 1680 or 1780 or 1880? Because the context changes things. So... Well, thank you, folks. I've enjoyed this, and great questions. Enjoy answering.